the homeless man in the brown overcoat chewed on his dirty thumb, staring off into the mist and dirty rain. He told me that his name was Angel. I stood next to this penniless vagrant with rapt attention. A man in a thousand dollar suit and more money than I knew what to do with. I listened to every word he said, writing some of it down. Hmm, you have to understand, Angel said, his hazel eyes rolling wildly as he stared past me at things only he could see. NASA is run by the reptilian overlords. They are a demonic agency with the power to kill people. Anyone who has real, solid evidence that shows the moon landing was fate gets murdered or dies under suspicious circumstances. NASA even killed Michael Jackson. And do you know why? I shook my head. A notebook perched in one hand and a solid gold fountain pen in the other. Angel leaned in close as if he was about to whisper a great secret. Because Michael Jackson's moonwalk became more famous than NASA's moonwalk. I looked up surprised. A thin smile played across the corners of my lips. Angel's expression stayed grave. A fit of laughter ripped its way out of my stomach. What? No way, I said, still chuckling loudly. But Angel only nodded grimly. NASA got jealous and decided that he had to go. They poisoned him, man. NASA has lots of hitmen on its payroll. They always get their target. I continued jotting down notes, trying to collect as much information as I could. NASA killed Michael Jackson because they were jealous that his moonwalk was better than theirs. I quickly scrawled in cursive across the expensive white paper. If you had told me a few days ago that I would spend many hours of my time roving around while listening to crazy addicts and rambling homeless people speak about conspiracy theories, I would have laughed. That is until I moved me and my daughter into Disney's brand new secret town and learned that not all conspiracy theories are fake. If I had listened to the first rumblings of bizarre rumors about the secret Disney town they were building in Florida and stayed far away, I wouldn't wake up screaming every night. I told my neighbor about it the day before the move. A shirtless man with a bulging beer belly and a black carpet of hair across his chest who went around telling everybody his name was J. Spot Jeffrey. While my 10-year-old daughter loves Disney stuff, I explained as he nodded vacantly, drinking down an entire can of light beer in a single long swallow before belching. And you know, her mom died last year. Oh, I was so sorry to hear about that, Jeffrey said, disingenuously putting out a fat hand across the low metal fence slung across our yards and patting me hard on the shoulder. You never know when it's your time, huh? One day you could just be driving down the highway and... Yeah, it was horrible, I said cutting him off. I remember the night that I had gotten the call telling me a tractor trailer had hit my wife's car. When I saw pictures of the vehicle later, it looked like little more than a twisted framework of black and steel. Everything around this house reminded me of her, it made my heart ache with regrets and loneliness. Nah, the town's not too far away, huh? You think I could come visit you once you get settled in? Jeffrey asked, and I looked at him in surprise. Why would you want to do that? I asked. I've heard a lot of urban legends about Disney. Not just how Walt Disney's head is cryogenically frozen, but a lot of creepier rumors too. I would just like to look around and see it. What do they call the new town? He asked. Storyland, I said. The town of Storyland. A few days later, my daughter Casey and I were driving down the private road towards Storyland. A metal gate finally embossed into silver images of Mickey Mouse and the Cinderella Castle loomed 20 feet in the air. A guard dressed in all black came out, taking my license and looking closely at it before allowing the gates to split open down the middle. Dozens of cameras peered down with their opaque lidless eyes, seeing everything but understanding nothing. Every time that our family visited Disney, I felt a sense of awe at seeing how much land they owned. Casey stared impassively out the window at the thick Florida swampland her green eyes the color of ivy, 
She wrinkled her nose as the fetid rank odor snuck in through the air conditioning and vents. It smells like swamp water here, she complained, putting her long sleeve up to her nose while breathing in through the fabric. I rolled down the windows a crack to try to let fresh air stream into the car, but it just made the smell worse. Well, that's because there's a swamp here, I said. It does smell pretty bad, huh? What if the whole town smells bad, Daddy? She asked. I don't want to live in a place that smells like that, even if Mickey does live here. She seemed to think on it for a long moment. Okay, maybe if both Mickey and Elsa live there, I'll be okay with it. I gave her a faint half-smile, tuning her out as she started to ramble about what kind of house Mickey Mouse would live in. It took us nearly 20 minutes from when we had passed through the gate to reach the first buildings of Storyland. The palm trees, thick vines and green swampy waters started to give way to perfectly manicured lawns. Welcome to Storyland, a cheerful sign read far ahead of us, curving over the road in silver letters five feet tall. Giant Disney characters filled with helium loomed over the street, grinning down at us in their frozen plastic expressions. Mickey and Minnie floated next to Elsa, Belle, and Simba. They all had their giant inflatable hands up in greeting. Some hidden mechanism inside the floating characters caused their arms to wave, moving back and forth in slow, lazy arcs. So cool, Casey said excitedly leaning over in her seat and hugging me. Her little arms wrapped around my neck as she kissed me on the cheek. Oh, thanks, Daddy, this place is the best. It doesn't smell like swamp in here anymore, I remarked as we stopped in front of the enormous gleaming sign. Two thick metal gates blocked the road. Tiny black half-spheres of hidden cameras blinked their red eyes in a rhythmic procession. After a few moments, the gates started sliding apart on their own. It all appeared to be fully automated. We pulled through, coming to a town at rate of excess in money. Casey nodded happily to herself, floating along on cloud nine as expensive mansions and castles loomed above us on both sides of the street. Her auburn hair had strawberry blonde streaks running through it. She opened her window and stuck her head outside like a dog letting her long hair flow behind her in the wind. Some of the castles appeared to be four or five stories high with giant glass windows cut into the hard gray stone. A few even had narrow moats of clear fresh water cut into the enormous lawns. Palm trees lined the yards of Victorian houses, their thin turrets reaching up into the sky like grasping fingers. Ferraris, Porsches, Lamborghinis, and other luxury cars shone in the driveways their sleek bodies emanating power and respect. And yet I didn't see anybody out in the yards. I found that odd. The GPS didn't work out here once we got off the public roads and onto Disney's private land. It acted as if we had driven straight into the middle of a forest. When I had bought the property at Storyland, they had sent me a map and a letter stating that they would begin setting up cell phone towers in the area within days. Digging through the middle console, I pulled out the folded map, squinting down it as I pulled over to the side of the road. We live at 777 Celebration Road, I said, frowning at the convoluted spiderwebs of streets that span the map in front of me. And we're on the road leading in. Looks like it's called Main Street USA, and if we take Main Street USA too. Casey gave a slow strangled squeak, the sound of a rabbit getting its neck snapped. It immediately snapped me out of my reverie. I looked up suddenly, seeing her staring out the passenger side window, her mouth agape. A child stood on the sidewalk with blood coming from the dark gaping holes in his eye sockets. He held his hands against his pale white cheeks. His mouth hung open in a silent scream. The many gaps in his tiny milk teeth showing through his pale lips. I'm stuck, he gurgled, blood pouring from his throat. I'm stuck in this place, help me. He looked straight up at the sky and I saw his throat had been slashed from ear to ear. The flash separated his crimson waterfall flowed down the front of his chest. Casey inhaled deeply like a drowning person coming up for the briefest moment of air. 
And then with lungs like a forge's bellows, she screamed an ear-splitting, high-pitched shriek of absolute terror. I jumped to action, putting the car into drive and peeling away from the walking corpse on the sidewalk. When I looked back, the boy had disappeared, but a few drops of bright, fresh blood still glistened brightly under the sharp rays of the Florida sun. What was wrong with that boy? Casey cried, tears streaming down her small, pinched face. Her red eyes turned to me, searching for answers, but I couldn't give her any. I pressed the gas hard, roughing the engine and glancing down at the map. Main Street, USA led to Frozen Lane and finally to Celebration Road. That must have been a joke, I said, trying to justify it to myself and to Casey. Hollywood makeup and fake blood. If that boy really had his throat cut like that, he wouldn't be standing and breathing. Casey's tears slowed as she blinked a few times, absorbing the statement. That's not a nice joke, she said, crossing her arms in front of her fluorescent blue t-shirt. If it was a joke, then that boy is a poop head, I nodded. The homes on Celebration Road were not so extravagant as the castles and Victorian mansions spanning down Main Street, USA. They all had perfectly manicured lawns and ground pools in the shape of classic Disney characters and beautiful wraparound porches and massive bay windows, however. The house that I had rented for a year after only seeing pictures of it came up quickly on our left. It was painted bright red, a three-story colonial with porches on every story and circular windows like glass monocles reflecting the tropical sunshine. We got out of the car walking up to the cobbled stone walkway toward the front door. A silver knocker with the beast's face on it stared back at us. Underneath the knocker I saw a printed note with a looping signature scrawled underneath it. I ripped it off, reading the note aloud as Casey played with the knocker. No drugs, alcohol, or tobacco products are allowed in Storyland due to the risk of interactions. Free samples of Mouse Z are given to all households, however. Mouse Z is a totally non-addictive, non-toxic, dietary supplement that will enhance your enjoyment while in Storyland. All guests and citizens of Storyland consent to exposure to Mouse Z through their food, water, air, or exposure to surfaces. Enjoy your stay and thanks again from the Disney Company. I scratched my head, reading the note again. What the heck was Mouse Z? It didn't sound like any dietary supplement that I had ever heard of. I scowled, squinting at the signature trying to make out the letters at the bottom. Mr. Crawley, it sounded like a made-up name. I crumpled up the note, unlocking the door. The cool, air-conditioned breeze blew past us with the smell of flowers and fresh paint. I saw vibrant plants scattered around the entrance room. Couches as white as virgin snow sat against the walls, each emblazoned with the black silhouette of the Cinderella castle and the Disney logo. A landline rang in the living room just as I walked past. My heart jumped into my throat when the shrill ringing had pierced the silence but I quickly calmed down when I realized it was just the phone. Hello? I said as soon as I had picked up the receiver. This is the guard at the front gate. You have a visitor named Jeffrey Stein, the man said in a flat tone. I sighed, looking down at my watch. That was quick. Jeffrey must have been really hot to see this weird little town. Yes, yeah, send him through, I said hanging up the phone. Casey had gone ahead into the kitchen and I quickly followed behind her. I'm so thirsty, I said, cutting through the living room with its enormous flat screen TV and comfortable sectionals. The kitchen had all brand new appliances and the fridge was stocked with food, soda, juices, and milk. I grabbed two sprites, giving one to Casey who opened it gratefully. I cracked mine open and chugged it all in a few huge gulps. It tasted a slightly strange, almost like the bitter aftertaste of caffeine. Casey wrinkled her tiny button nose. Uh, this soda tastes old, she complained. I tried looking at the expiration date, but everything suddenly seemed blurry. I blinked quickly, but my eyes teared up. I felt very weird, disassociated and floating. The world flickered like a shimmering mirage. The dull colors and faded texture of reality throbbed, 
like the cobwebs of a nightmarish fever dream. My vision started to ripple and morph within seconds. I looked down at Casey, but where my daughter had been standing, I now saw a nightmarish creature with giant glassy black eyes. I stepped back, crying out, What's wrong, Daddy? The demonic figure hissed in a deep and gurgling voice, with red skin stretched thin over its bony head and black talons on its hands. It looked like it had stepped straight out of the underworld. It opened its mouth, revealing needle-sharp teeth growing out of its oozing gums like hundreds of tumors. Two enormous pointed mouse ears were surgically attached to its shiny skin. Black stitches struck out like pieces of barbed wire at the base of the rotted brown ears. Dried crusts of orange pus clung to the sides of its head, like the decomposing riverbeds of some ancient, diseased tributary. What's going on? What? Get back! I cried, putting my hands up. The thing just laughed, gnashing its torn slash of a mouth as its lidless black eyes gleamed with glee. This world is our creation for your kind. There are many surprises in Storyland for the sons and daughters of Adam. I am Mr. Crawley and I'll be your guide. Come and see, he said running forward and lunging for my throat with his twisted jungle of fangs. I spun around fleeing through the morphine door with thousands of teeth that appeared in front of me. The sides of the door flexed and shivered like the lips of some alien predator. With a wet sloshing sound, the door started to close around me, and the enormous fangs drawing nearer. I lunged through it, landing hard in the black and spongy earth. I raised my head and beheld an amazing sight. An extraterrestrial landscape stretched out to the horizon, with writhing snake-like jungle vines dancing across its surface. Castles, thousands of stories high, loomed far off in the distance like great mountains, their sharp turrets piercing the crimson clouds and disappearing from view. Spinning black holes sent out great jets of light in planetary rings like those of Saturn, shone through the narrow breaks in the blood-red clouds that covered the sky like tumors. Thick patches of shimmering silver fog swept across the landscape, obscuring entire swaths of the eldritch jungle. A plume of fluffy, luminescent fog a few dozen feet away disappeared like a breath of smoke as a humid jungle breeze blew past. The insane creature with the mouse ears surgically attached to its body stood in the midst of it, his black eyes glittering with insanity as he stared straight at me. This is my world, he said as a silver saliva dripped from his grinning mouth. Do you think you can run from me? I am everywhere, in the wind and in the trees and even in you. I am Mr. Crawley and I know who you are. Your daughter is here with us too. I shook my head, closing my eyes. This is some hallucination, I said, trying to reassure myself. I bet this place isn't even owned by Disney. It's probably some CIA black site where they experiment on people with new drugs. Mr. Crawley laughed at this. This world is the rock which the builders rejected and which has become the cornerstone of all things. We have made it so. You will not leave until we allow it, and we can make every moment of your time stretch out to a million years. By the time that eternity passed, the only thing that would return to your body would be an insane, empty shell of a mind. Mr. Crawley hissed, his blank obsidian eyes gleaming with cruelty. What do you want with me? I whispered. Only this. The creature gurgled as the bloody clouds above us whipped and soared in circles like the currents of a hurricane. You must call more people into Storyland, many more. If you bring others to this world, the cornerstone of all realities, we will let you and the girl leave in peace. His voice and the world began to blow away like smoke in a strong breeze. Everything grew faint and distant. But if not, we will follow you and then. Only the death of the universe many eternities from now would bring you any release from the endless suffering of Storyland. I groaned, feeling blood running down my face. I opened my eyes. Sharp stabbing pains emanated from various spots all over my body. 
Hey, buddy, Jeffrey said, leaning low over me and slightly slapping my face. What the heck is going on here? I looked around, seeing that I had run straight through the sliding door in the back of the house at Storyland. I was lying surrounded by twinkling shards of glass on the concrete patio. To my amazement, I saw Jeffrey had his shirt on for the first time as long as I had known him. The white fabric of the t-shirt was stretched thin across his bulging fat stomach. Oh God, my head, I said, bringing my hand up to my forehead. My fingers came away wet with blood. I had the craziest dream, Jeffrey. We got here and there was some bizarre note on the door saying that all food and drinks and stuff were laced with some weird drug. And then I drank a can of soda and... I trailed off, my heart suddenly speeding up in my chest. Where's Casey at, Jeffrey? He shook his head dumbfounded. I just got here and heard the door shattering back here. I circled around your yard and found you here like this. I have no idea where the girl is, he said looking around with concern. He had the look of a man who had accidentally walked into a lunatic asylum filled with dangerous inmates. Don't drink or eat anything here, Jeffrey, I said, vehemently raving. Don't wash your hands, don't touch the water or anything. I don't know what's going on here, but it's not normal. There's something unnatural. That was really the core of it. The entire experience with Mouse Z had seemed like something real. Not like the creeping delusions of a drug trap. Jeffrey gave me a confused look, taking a step back from me. I think I should probably call an ambulance, he said, not meeting my eyes. You might have had a concussion, bud. Just calm down, okay? I don't think anybody's drugging this entire town. That sounds like something from a bad sci-fi movie. I mean, come on, James. Think about it. Help me up, I said, putting out my hand. Jeffrey pulled me up, and my head swam as black modes danced across my vision. As I tried steadying myself, leaning heavily on Jeffrey's thick shoulder, I felt the world spinning around me. We need to find Casey. Okay, bud, easy does it, he said, putting a meaty arm around me. He opened the shattered sliding door, the sparkling shards of glass crunched under our feet like dead leaves. I felt a small amount of strength returning to me as I staggered forward, wheezing like an asthmatic. After I'd blood, it caked my arms and fresh drops still ran down from a cut across my forehead. You see, there's Casey right there, Jeffrey said reassuringly pointing to the couch in the living room. I glanced over hopefully, but my heart dropped when I saw what was laying on the couch. It was about the size of my daughter, but it looked like the nightmarish results of some mad scientist with a death camp full of patience and unlimited funding. I saw the face of my daughter there and even recognized her fluorescent blue t-shirt, but something was terribly wrong with her now. The half-human, half-mouse abomination on the couch looked up at us with eyes full of agony. The jellied whites of her eyes glistened like pools of pus. Bright rivulets of blood dribbled down the soft white hairs covering her face. Her legs were twisted, broken sticks that had the same pink fleshy hue of a mouse's paws. Blood bubbled from her shivering lips. Garish black stitches ran up and down her body in irregular square patches. The ears of some enormous genetically engineered mouse had been sewn onto her hairless and cut-up skull. A rainbow of liquids dripped from these surgical sites, dripping in sickly infected oranges and clotted dark reds. Broken bones stuck outwards through the skin of her arms and legs like daggers stabbed through her. God, what happened? Is that really you, Casey? I said, ripping myself away from Jeffrey and stumbling across the room. Kill me, she whispered as pink, a fetid drool dribbled down her mouth. It hurts. Please kill me. I heard a gurgling laugh from behind me. I turned my head to see Mr. Crawley standing in the place of Jeffrey. Behind him, the red sky of that other world is shown through the shattered sliding door into our house at Storyland. How oh, do you think you can escape that easily? If you do not bring me new tributes, I will draw every drop of agony from you and your daughter that the human mind can experience. And when you are destroyed, trembling, insane, only then will I allow you to go, slowly and painfully. 
So do you agree to the terms? Will you bring us new tributes? Never. I would rather die than bring other people into this nightmare. The twisted body of Casey on the couch continued gurgling and spitting up frothy blood. Mr. Crawley's face changed into an expression of pleasure at the challenge. Oh, we do love a fighter here at Storyland, he said grinning widely, showing off the hundreds of needle-like fangs that poked out of his mouth like the quills of a porcupine. He snapped his long, tapering fingers together, his talons flashed and threw off sparks of white light. The red alien sky behind Mr. Crawley seemed to swirl and bubble faster. Perhaps some of our pets here can change your mind. His black, lidless eyes spun in their sockets as he glanced back through the shattered door into the alien jungles beyond. I watched in horror as two creatures from my nightmare came loping out from the thick vines and dancing brush. This is the beast in Simba, Mr. Crawley said, his shrill laughter ripping through the air like the rending of metal. And I saw in the front a half-human, half-animal combination with long flowing black hair all over its body. Its powerful leg and arm muscles positioned like machines as it loped gracefully through the door. Its eyes gleamed pure white like spoiled milk. It gnashed its massive jaws together, sending out long streams of drool that flew out behind it. Next to the beast, a hairless lion with surgical marks all over its body limped quickly forward. It had an extra eye surgically inserted into its forehead, and each of its legs had extra paws sewn on the back. The lion's three eyes glistened with bloodlust and hunger. Their heavy body shook the floor as they sped towards me and my daughter. I turned to the beat-up body of Casey on the couch. She had seen death coming towards her in this new place and now fell with a thud to the ground in an attempt to escape it. She tried crawling away and I ran towards her as a heavy weight came down on my back. I spun around to see the mouth of the lion opening wide inches from my face. A deep, throaty growl emanated from its chest. It brought its paws down on my chest and I felt my ribs snap like twigs. They shattered with a sound like ice cracking. Behind me, Casey gave a straggled shriek of agony as the beast tore into her with its powerful jaws. The sounds of our screams echoed across the room. I felt my vocal cords tear as blood spurted from my mouth. The pain seemed to go on and on as the jaws came down and down again and again, ripping off pieces of me. Eventually, once I was nearly gone, Mr. Crawley came over, peering down at me with his glistening beetle eyes. Will you bring new tributes, or do we need to repeat this for the next trillion years? He asked in a cold, psychopathic tone. I nodded my head, spitting out broken teeth and blood. I'll do it, I groaned slowly, feeling that most of the bones in my body had shattered. Every breath felt like I was inhaling acid. I looked down, seeing parts of my arm and legs torn off. My intestines peeked through the mass of flesh around my stomach, like a coiled snake looking out of its den. Mr. Crawley grinned, nodding to the animals. The lion knelt down, and with a powerful crunch of its jaws, it ripped my throat out. The world quickly went black as endless pain reverberated through my consciousness, and cold death overtook me. Slowly, languidly, I opened my eyes and found myself on the kitchen floor. Casey was laying next to me, her pupils dilated and mouth open. Drool plodded on the linoleum beneath her catatonic face. Casey, I said weakly, pushing myself up. My entire body felt sore as if I felt reflections of that new death, a sensation that had just ripped across my mind moments earlier. I wanted to grab Casey and get out of there, but I couldn't trust my own mind anymore. I knew that if I didn't do what Mr. Crawley wanted, I would keep getting stuck in this nightmarish world. It was like an eternity of false awakenings, a type of place that I had never imagined in my wildest nightmare. I didn't know if this one would prove to be the same. Without hesitation, I picked up my unconscious daughter and brought her out to the car. Jeffrey pulled up with his middle-aged girlfriend moments later. They gawked at us with open mouths. Hey, go on inside and have some drinks, I yelled at them. I just have to go up to the gatehouse for a few minutes. 
Have a seat, look around, and make yourself comfortable. Jeffrey nodded and gave me a thumbs up. I peeled out of there. Casey awoke as we drove the long track back towards the guardhouse. Once we were a few minutes away, my cell phone started pinging again and I realized that I had service. I pulled up slowly to the metal gate, looking out at the guard in his sleek uniform. He peeked out of the guardhouse, but the shape didn't look human. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I glimpsed a dark silhouette with mouse ears and black eyes. The figure quickly disappeared back beyond the door. Shaking, I looked down at my phone and I sent a mass text message to all my friends. Hey everyone, I just rented a house at an exclusive Disney town. My address is at 777 Celebration Road, Storyland. Unlimited free drinks and food there. Feel free to let yourselves in and stay as long as you want. Make yourselves at home and explore the town. I will not be at the house, however, just tell the guard that you know me. As soon as I pressed send, the gate started to swing to the side, and I left that den of horrors. I glanced back and saw two obsidian eyes and a grinning slash of a mouth peering out of the guardhouse. I shuddered. I finished telling my story to Angel, who nodded unsurprised. The homeless lunatic knew all about conspiracy theories. He had told me about Walt Disney's frozen head the ghosts at Disney World and all these suspicious deaths covered up there. I'm not surprised that they're working with the CIA now on some weird mind control drug, Angel said, his eyes gleaming darkly in the streetlights. It is, after all, their world. I backed up, a cold shiver running through my spine as those words rang out around me again. They were words that I hadn't heard since the horrors of Storyland. In the darkness of the alleyway, I thought that I saw the silhouette of mouse ears on Angel's head and teeth growing out of his gums like tumors. I blinked and he was just a normal vagrant again. I hope this isn't the world of Storyland, I said, a sense of desperation clenching my heart. Sometimes I wonder if I ever left it. I wonder if Casey and I are still there waiting for the next round of attack. Angel only grinned, his lips spreading wide, and in the shadows of the alley, his teeth jutted out like hundreds of needles. To those who fell in the Battle of Scarville, the stone memorial read, Your sacrifices were not in vain. October 24th, 1918 to October 27th, 1918. Above the base stood a statue of an American soldier with a round cap and a long rifle with a bayonet attached. His face had a perpetual scowl, his eyes slightly squinted as the statue looked at something far off in the distance. I heard a throat clearing. I looked around in confusion. A beautiful memorial, eh? A voice said from behind me. I turned and saw an ancient looking man in a suit. His face had so many wrinkles that it reminded me of a raisin. His ears and nose stood out massively on his shaking frame. I wondered just how old this man really was. Yes, it certainly is, I admitted, and glancing once more at the shining marble statue which seemed to glow under the bright summer sun. But what is the Battle of Scarville? I've never even heard of it. The ranger shook his head sadly at this. Most of the younger people haven't, he said gruffly, but my family was involved in the Battle of Scarville. If you have a few minutes, I can tell you all about it. He motioned to a bench next to a statue, one that I could have sworn wasn't there just a few seconds earlier. I shrugged it off though, admitting to myself that I might have missed it due to the glare of the sun, which was slowly disappearing behind the trees. We both sat down and he told me that his name was Franklin, and I told him that mine was Ted. We shook after we had introduced ourselves, the small bird-like bones of his fragile hand feeling almost weightless under my grasp. And then Franklin began to tell me a story that would change my life forever. I was just a kid when this happened. My father was a soldier in the area, but he never liked to talk about what he did. And then one day he came running in the living room, his eyes all wide, 
telling me and my mom to get all of our stuff quick and that it was time to go, and all this other nonsense. My mother asked why, and he started screaming gibberish about monsters and this and that. And my mother says the strangest thing. Oh, is it that time again? And right then, the shaking starts outside. Oh God, it's too late, my father says, and he puts his face in his hands, crying. Now my father was not a man who ever cried. I didn't even see him cry at my grandfather's funeral. He was made of stone and one of the toughest men that I knew. So when he started crying, I knew something bad was happening. The sky started to go dark as if there was a solar eclipse. My mom grabs a canvas bag and starts trying to go around the house and grabbing some food and drinks. But my dad yells and says that we have no time for that. He tells her to grab his other gun, the 12 gauge in the closet upstairs. He runs downstairs and grabs his rifle, shoving a magazine in it and standing at the door, straight as a board and as pale as a sheet. The sky seemed to go dark even though it was still over an hour until sunset. Out of the darkness I saw silhouettes, stumbling shapes with a twisted legs, a broken arms, a long necks and strange eyes. They continued forward at a much faster pace than any walking man. Their eyes seemed to glow in the dark and the closer they got the more hypnotized I felt. There was a strange pulsating light that came out of their faces you see. If you stared at it too long you would get carried away by that light. My dad, though, didn't hesitate for a moment. He started shooting as soon as they were within range of the 30 6 The nearest ones had exploded in a shower of dark red. The rest of them began hissing like snakes and running forwards. My dad empties his whole magazine, taking down six of them, and then slams and locks the door. Where is that gun? He screamed. My mom came running down the hallway with the big black thing in one hand and a full box of slugs in the other. He grabs the gun from her and gives it to me. You know how to shoot, boy, he says. Now it's time for you to prove yourself. Protect your family and home. By this point, dozens of those things are slamming on the other side of the door, still hissing and gurgling in some strange language that I had never heard before. I nodded at my dad and started slamming slugs into the shotgun. They were practically breaking the door down by this point. The lock had started to bust and twist and the door was separating from the threshold. A couple more good hits and it would have been all over the floor anyway. I know a good slug will shoot through doors, heck they'll shoot through walls so. I pointed the shotgun at the door point blank and began shooting through the door. Some of those things start screaming and falling over dad. Exit wounds the size of grapefruit in their backs and chests. But the door is in a sorry state by this point, full of massive holes and uh, splintering apart. I had to reload and they started busting through coming into the house. And not that they were close, I could tell that they were not human, though from a distance they almost looked human but they had these strange, pulsating black veins going up their neck and stretching out across their face, and their eyes were all the same silver color, glowing as if they had some inner light. It wasn't just a reflection like you see with some animals at night who run in front of your headlights. The light was coming from within them and it was bright. Some of them had blood caked around their mouths, running down their clothes and the entire fronts of their bodies whose blood I didn't yet know, but when I saw the casualties in the town later on, I would figure it out. Just when I thought that we were going to be overwhelmed, my neighbor and some of his family members ran over. He started screaming at me from the yard, firing his gun at the creatures in a frenzy of violence. He had his two sons with him and they all had shotguns. They were whooping and hollering, blowing the creatures apart with buckshot. When one of them stopped to reload, the other two would cover them, so that they had a nearly constant rate of fire. My dad and I ran out the door shooting and reloading. I saw the skull of the nearest creature disintegrate as I fired it into its head from less than five feet away. 
but its eyes seemed to hover in the air a moment after it was gone. It reminded me of the Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland, how its face seemed to hang in the air after its body had gone. By this point, we had finished off the entire group of them. A couple dozen bodies lay around us. My heart was beating and my blood was up. I could almost relate to the sons of my neighbor. Part of me wanted to whoop and holler too. Part of it was fun and exciting, even though I knew that one wrong move would mean likely death. I used the break in the action to move closer to one of the corpses and look at it. In its basic shape, it looked human, but up close you could tell that it was no such thing. For one thing, they all had six fingers on each hand and they were twisted, long things. They almost looked vampiric and, as I would find out later, that was right on the money, or at least as close to it as we could understand. Their skin had thin, black veins running every which way and they appeared to all be wearing some sort of coarse brown cloth, formed into shapeless pants and shirts. They even covered their feet with it, though they had some sort of leather on the bottom. It didn't look like any leather that I had seen, however. It shone and shimmered and it looked inflexible and thick. It looked chitinous. Out in the field, we heard a sound like a screaming woman. It broke the silence and caused all of us to jump, spinning around and pointing our guns. But what we saw there was no scared lady. It was some sort of animal standing over 10 feet tall. It looked like some huge praying mantis, except its hide was shiny and black. Massive pinchers extended from the front of its face, big enough to chop a man in half down the middle, I reckon. The eyes were huge and black, but as the light moved across them, they seemed to shimmer like rainbows. What in God's name is that? My dad yelled, but the neighbors only shook their heads in amazement. Then one of the boys, a red-headed and skinny lad by the name of Wesley, said something that caught me off guard. I saw some of those things coming out of the caves, he said. I looked at him eyes wide. So did everyone else. When I was fishing earlier at the stream, I thought that it was people just exploring the tunnels at first, until I saw their eyes in those veins. His father grabbed his shoulder and shook him. When was it? His father asked him, looking scared and uncertain. How long ago, son? His son shook his head slowly, trying to remember. An hour ago, maybe, Wesley said. As soon as I saw them, I started running home, and not five minutes later after I got there, they started coming across the yard. The people from town were running down the road now, screaming in terror and pain. I saw them driven on like herds of sheep, and our giant praying mantis friend had also noticed. Its head went up, antenna flicking, head cocked to the side in a way that would have been comical in other circumstances. Its pinchers moved faster, opening and closing constantly, as if it were trying to taste the air. And then it started running. It was just a black blur in the dim light flying across the yard at an impossible speed. I couldn't even see its legs moving. It grabbed the nearest person, a young woman with huge terrified eyes, and used its pinchers to snap her head right off. The head rolled across the ground, an expression of mortal terror still etched into her expression. Then the mantis creature began to suck at the bleeding stump of her neck, drinking until it looked like the body was sucking in on itself until the skin was pale and bloodless as a mannequin. The other people were stumbling and running around it, still praying and cursing and shrieking, but it took no notice of them. Once it was full, it looked bigger, more swelled up like a tick. Its chitinous black shell seemed to expand, looking more rounded, and it even looked a little more red in the pale light, as if the blackness of its hide had lightened into a shade of darkest crimson. We're being invaded by vampires, I screamed. Everybody looked at me, but nobody argued. They didn't even have time to. At that moment, the next wave had started. Our home was on a road with houses every few hundred feet, a forest behind the houses, and a grassy field on the other side. The road itself sat between the field and the homes. 
the trees pressed in on the houses being only 20 or 30 feet behind them. The woods were old and thick with brush and prickers and endless ferns. It was hard enough to see it at daytime, but it was now nearly night, and trying to see through it, it was a fool's errand. The enemy used our disadvantage to surprise us. We had all reloaded, of course, and we had five men with guns. I wish that I had another one to give to my mom who stood behind my dad. Both of them looked scared and far too pale. I saw it was the mantis creatures that were approaching, though a few of the vampires walked through silently, their eyes glowing. The two apex predators didn't seem inclined to attack each other. I wondered if maybe the vampires had even domesticated the giant mantis creatures somehow. It didn't seem likely, but who knew? We started shooting as soon as they broke the boundary of the woods. The mantis creatures shrieked like dying women, emitting deafening wails as their legs, chests, and heads were blown apart by shotgun and rifle fire. But more and more kept coming, and some were now coming from the field and road as well. We were slowly being surrounded and our ammo was not unlimited. A vampire ran at my mother. I saw it in slow motion, the creature popping out from the grassy field and sprinting. My father was busy firing that rifle like a madman trying to keep the mantis creatures from overtaking us. I knew that it was hopeless, but I could at least save my mom. I raised the shotgun, the vampire only a few feet away from me now, and I shot it point blank. Its head disintegrated. My mouth had been open and I was breathing hard, terrified and in the middle of battle fever, you see and a few droplets of that strange dark blood splattered directly into my mouth. I hadn't even realized what had happened until I tasted it. It tasted nothing at all like human blood. Nothing like sucking on a cut thumb after a small injury. Nothing like the taste of a bloody rare steak. Now this blood was sweet and somehow cloying. It was an artificial sweetness, like some fake sugar that you might put in coffee combined with a vague metallic aftertaste. I started to spit after I realized what had happened, but by that point, we were being overrun. My neighbor was ripped apart in front of me, his old weather-beaten face showing a final expression of shock and horror as a mantis bit him across his body right where his heart lay. Blood spurted from the wound. The mantis gingerly pushed the body parts apart and began to suck at the blood from the spurting injuries. Another followed as silently behind and started feeding on the other half. I watched it all in horror, until the hand grabbed my shoulder. I spun and saw Wesley. We need to go, now, he said, pulling me. My dad and mom and the others, though, I screamed. He shook his head. He was closest to me as we became overrun. The creatures had split us into smaller groups. Wesley's brother and my mom and dad were one of them. We had at least five mantis creatures and a few more vampires between us. As dozens more came running towards us, towards commotion and the prospect of a warm meal, I realized that Wesley was right. But I fired all the same, taking down one of the mantis creatures with a slug to the torso. It's dark, blood covered the dirt as it squealed and fell over kicking its legs slowly and rhythmically like a flipped turtle as it died. My dad and Wesley's brother were still shooting. I thanked God that we each had a sack of ammo, but mine was feeling light. I looked down and saw only a dozen more slugs maybe. They must be getting low too. I knew that I would have to come back for them when things had calmed down, but for now I fled. Wesley ran ahead of me as coarse work clothes flapping in the wind. We sprinted across the yard. I looked back and saw one of the mantis creatures running us down, moving much faster than either of us could ever hope to run. I stopped turning. It felt like I was facing down a charging train. I raised the gun and with a shot to the head, it dropped only ten feet away from me. It kept running for a second to body without any brain to run it. And then it began to fall forward, sliding, its legs kicking and trembling as it died. He had a shelter behind his house, apparently. It was little more than a root cellar in the backyard of his house, but it was hidden and underground. 
He pulled the latch on the hatchway, opening it and motioning for me to go first. I ran forward, climbing down the short ladder. He followed, keeping the hatchway open for light while he started a gas lamp with some flint. Once we were situated, he closed the hatch. I was able to be locked from the inside and was reinforced against tornadoes, with wood and concrete forming the walls. We also had some supplies down there. Water in jars of pickled foods and jerky. Not much variety, but it would do. We stayed down there for two days, and when we came back up, the creatures were gone. They had even taken their dead with them. I didn't know where they had gone, though. I assumed it was back into the caves. They had left our dead, however. Countless bodies lay all around the surrounding towns. I saw endless dead in the downtown area when I went down there. And I never saw my dad or mom again. Never even found their bodies. Perhaps they had been dragged off into the woods or perhaps the creatures took a few bodies back with them. Maybe as souvenirs or for meat. All the people who died in the Battle of Scarville were reported as casualties from the Great War or the Spanish Flu. But those of us who were there know what we saw and these were no flu victims. Thousands of bodies around the town had all the blood drained from them. I wonder why those creatures from underground didn't keep going. After all, they had won the Battle of Scarville, which was really just more of a massacre. But then I thought about how deer hunters are only allowed to hunt so many per season, to allow the population to regrow every year. And I thought about those abominations under the earth. And I wondered if maybe, just maybe, they might not be doing the same to us, waiting for the human population to grow for a hundred years or so, then when the population is fat and healthy and lazy, come back out to feed on the herd. The old man stopped, clearing his throat and looking over at me. His story had apparently come to an end. He smiled slightly at me, but I kept looking at him suspiciously, waiting for some sort of punchline. You realize how insane that sounds, I asked after a few moments. The old man with his withered face just grinned at me. And in the dying light of the setting sun, I could have sworn his eyes were glowing. <laughs>